which companies are actually, or do you expect to be slowly dying right now? We can give you one example we thought of, and then we can give them yeah one minute to enter. The best example we could thought of right now is perhaps the accountant business in Denmark. A few years back, legislation changed, so you don't have to have a uh, Reinscap. Yeah. It's basically measuring your taxation and doing your taxes, then you have an accounting, uh, accountant to do it for you. Yeah, and we, you don't need that more by law, you, you used to have. So now you have all of a sudden online systems. I do it in my company. I do everything online. It tells me what to put, which information to put in which boxes. I don't use an accountant. So we considered maybe this could be one of the businesses that are actually slowly dying because something has changed. So my question to you is which stocks are you going to short? So what are the companies that are slowly dying? Just been one minute and well, okay, yeah. we have an, yeah. Videx. Videx is definitely slowly dying. Just Videx. to give everybody who knows, Videx is a Videx, company. Denmark has about, what, 50, 60% of the world market of hearing aids. Yeah. We have Oticon, G and Resound, and Videx. Mm -hmm. And Videx is a smaller one with about 10% of the market share. They are extremely good, they are well funded, but they are, um, they, they are in the bottom round corner. corner. They are uh, inappropriate goals, they are technically very, very, very good, but they never ever do market surveys. Or There's a joke about VDEX that they produce hearing aids, put them on the parking lot, and then just hope for customers to pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent example. <laughs> yeah? Other good examples? <laughs> yeah. Uh, television. Now you have uh, streaming like Netflix and Amazon and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that could maybe slowly dying. At least they need to come up with a strategy. Anyone so else? Yeah. Ooh, coffee. Oh, yeah, the thing about coffee and yeah. sorry. I would say that like the, the mo uh, mobile broadband we have today is going to slowly die because mm -hmm. we have 5G coming and I think that would erase all the like local companies that we have today. So 5G would like take it all away. So, so if you're a company that only have like 4G or 3D, yeah. Then so fiber they need works to today. Like mobile broadband works today, mm -hmm. but fiber is more like people have it more installed in the homes. But in the future, I think 5G will take over because it mm -hmm. would be a smart city, like you talked about yep. before. Mm -hmm. So you will not need fiber either at oh. that point. So. Interesting. Yeah. We also talked about, uh, okay, your example is probably better than mine. Oh, I don't know <laughs> about that. Uh, but what about like businesses that are no longer in the limelight, like radio, but mm. they have like a new <coughs> nemesis in podcasting and such. Yep. So I don't know if you could say that <laughs> like they're going out of business, they might already be considered to be out of business, but it's still, there's some sort of disruption here that mm. they will need to deal with. Exactly, what about them? They need to make new decisions, they need to find some way to refocus their products, perhaps podcast, mm -hmm. perhaps something that is more customized. But the market changes and you as a, as a company, if you want to be effective, then you need to find new goals, a new strategy that actually support that you will be sustainable in the long run. We were talking about Bang & Olufsen, mm. which 20 years ago, 15 years ago, was a super successful company making big TVs and what, one of the things they could do was they could make speakers and they could, they could calibrate these TVs so they were super nice and design wise they were good as well. Suddenly flat screen TVs come by and these flat screens are almost as good design as BNOs, uh, Bang & Olufsen's and they've been struggling, they've been bleeding cash for many years and it seems they're finding a niche, uh, portable audio, portable uh, products but they're still struggling. I'm not sure they're making money yet, but they've been bleeding for many years. So back to mm. this. Thank you for the comments. Um, yeah, the four functions of planning. Basically, just as I said, planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. You as a manager, if you know these four things, then that's it. So one of the things about, uh, about planning is to decide the strategy. And in this course, we differentiate <laughs> very crudely between two general strategies. Either you're a low-cost solution 
or you look for low cost or you differentiate. Meaning that you do something, produce something that is different than your competitors and because it's different, it makes you able to charge a higher price. Uh, but if it's commodity goods, simple, comparable goods, then you can pre uh, compete on price and then you have to work your strategy to keep your cost low. So those are the basic two things. Here, if you're in low cost, uh, then down here you have identical, um, the products are identical, low differentiation, the benefits are the same, but you're offering things at a higher price. So this is a bad place to be in. Of course, we want all, all of us wants to be here. You offer something that is different and desirable to your customers, and you can still keep a high price. And you can also allow yourself to have high production costs. I mean, Apple is one of these examples of delivering something that is still considered a differentiated product to a super normal price. They have one of the highest average uh, uh, profits in industry. And they also work on their cost, but they can allow themselves to have a higher cost in production. So these are the basic two strategies that we work with. So when organizing, what you have to do is establish task authority. Establishing task authority is simply about who talks to who. If I run my business, who do I talk to to get something done? In your regular ice cream shop, if I need to get more cash, I need to get new stuff, who do I talk to? That is what you set up. You get people to work together and you get them to achieve these goals by setting up the organization. And we all and all companies, they struggle with the same things. It's about who's doing what. This is a slideshow, a slide from a company that does audio equipment. They have, of course, headwaters and that's divided into research and development. So we have some people, engineers, they work there, come up with good stuff. And when they're done, they throw it into production. Things are produced, they go into market. And while production is ramping up, marketing works to do interesting advertising to make sure they're customers. And of course, everyone is accountable to accounting and finance. We always have to do that. But then, this is not a big company, then we have the Project X, the new thing. I mean, usually we have five engineers here and we have a couple people here and someone in marketing, but Project X is going to be the new thing. And that project uh, requires collaboration between engineering, development and marketing. So here we suddenly go from a functional structure to a more project-based structure. We have to pull people out of these departments to make it work, to make this project work. So we drag resources out of departments that now probably have full-time jobs to work on a project. It always creates tension. And that's what you as managers are going to do. You're going to make these decisions. You're going to work in the function or you're going to work in the project. And if I do something, I drag resources from one place and put them into another. Here we have a radar company. They're basically organized in a functional structure. They have a department for structural engineering. They have mechanical engineering and they have electrical engineering. All these parts are necessary to build this radar system. It's a Danish company. They build the uh, Doppler radars, which are super nice. But the way they work is that it's always a project. The advantage of having people in functions is that you have people that are like-minded. They have the same technical skills. If you have a problem, you can always talk to your neighbor and you can get good feedback. So you have a, a higher chance of getting a technical better solution in a functional structure simply because you can get feedback on your things. But every time they do a project, they draw resources from each of the departments because the projects require these different resources. And that makes the projects not weak, but it makes them susceptible to change because you don't have five structural engineers in a project. You have one, and you have one electrical engineer, and you have one or the other. And sometimes that per person might not be super good at his game, or that particular game, and then he has to go back into the functional structure. And this is the tension we always have. We go from a poor functional structure, lightweight project, all the way over to heavyweight project or poor project organization. Pros and cons to each, it's all a matter of what is your business model, what do you want to achieve, and what is the organization you have. You mix the cards, you set the team, you try to make this work the best as possible. Then we go into leading, create the vision, motivate all your people. 
make sure that you coordinate and have these people work together. That's the way we, we have uh, and reach our organizational goals. So here I'm just simply sketching out that if we have these functions of uh, uh, layers in, in, in management, we basically in this course say that there are three layers of management. You have the first line managers, you have the middle and the top managers, and on top of that you have a CEO, one single person that's responsible. Many Danish companies doesn't need necessarily have three layers. They often don't only have two or one. We are a nation of 99 point something, 3% small and mid-sized companies, meaning they are up to 249 people. And not all of these, most of them, though, at least the small companies, they don't have three layers. They have a CEO and he might be all over. But the thing is, if you have a larger companies, the competence or the, uh, the, the functions of a, of a manager, they change a lot. The planning part is not very f uh, a big thing of the first line manager, but he's a leader. And here's an interesting irony, because the first line manager is usually someone who's technically skilled or someone who's just a bit good at people. We promote him to be a leader. He is now managing people. He has the least leading education, the least management education at all. But he's responsible for most of the leading in the company because he has perhaps 10 or 15 people below him. The day-to-day -day leading, the day-to-day -day management, that's where it happens. So when we do organizational development, usually we do something called uh, lean, lean management, we do value stream mapping, we do process development. And this assumes that the first line manager can actually lead. And this is where usually most of our problems are. We have to teach first line managers how to lead. The middle managers, they don't do as much leading and the top managers uh, do very little leading, leading. They talk to all the people, they create the vision, they motivate, but they don't have that day-to-day -day direct contact. So that's sort of the, the pyramid that we're looking at in the organization. As we talked about sustainability and uh, Philip Binning talked about sustainability, in this course we have some a little bit about ethics. We think that there is both good and evil management and we like to promote good management. Good management means that your employees go home, they are still happy, they're not crying, they're not turning in for a long-term long -term sick leave, they have good psychosocial work environment. So it's sustainable both for the individual and the organization. So it's a people skill and it's a contact sport. And you just have to learn this. Listen, be empathetic, work with your people. <laughs> and basically, make money in the companies, but don't squeeze the last drop of blood out of your employees. And this goes back to the business model. If you have a business model that requires people to work 150% just to make a little bit of money, then perhaps the business model is wrong. Perhaps you're not differentiating enough. Perhaps you're simply focusing wrong. We're back to the discussion about slowly dying company. Yeah. Uh, just a point about the good and evil management. Uh, when I worked at uh, Novo Nordisk, I had a few times when I was visited the plant in China. And it's placed within this large area with a lot of production sites. And one of the companies that was also placed there was Foxconn. I don't know if you know Foxconn, but Foxconn is a major supplier to Apple. And they became infamous for uh, their employees committing suicide because of work pressure. One of the ways that the employees sometimes decided to end their life was by jumping out from the building. And uh, the story was in the press that what Foxconn did was put a net around the building. <laughs> so you could jump off, you couldn't kill yourself. And I was just curious about when I saw the Foxconn flag, I thought, I'm going to go and see this factory because I don't believe this. But it was actually correct. There was a fence on top of the building, there was a net around the building. So even though how much you wanted, you couldn't jump off the building and kill yourself. And this is just an example of what I consider evil management, because you're pressuring people so hard that they basically don't want to live anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so it's true. Yeah. <laughs> That's the extreme case of individualizing uh, well-being at work. We work a lot about uh, with work environment. And a classic issue is that stress is an organizational problem, but most companies handle it individually. So it's not because we designed the work wrong, but it's just because, well, you can't cope. If you can't stand the smell, then you better leave the kitchen. 
And the real way to work with the occupational health or, or psychosocial work environment is that this is a function of the way we organize. And if we organize for stressful work, then people will burn out. In some types of work where we can just replace people, then that might be a good business model. As we have work that requires increasing investments in people, then that might be a really bad business model. And there's a change coming right now that we feel that a lot of companies are getting more focused on work environment. And that's particularly the knowledge companies because they have young people coming in and they have old engineers and they have to work and suddenly they see that these, these knowledgeable people, they get stressed and they go on a sick leave and suddenly most of their business model fall apart. So they have to keep their workers not just happy but functional and well. So last part of this is controlling. And that's simply about establishing measures performance management systems and the likes. Here's a, a slide from a company we visited. This was in the, in the, in the, in the lunchroom where you have the accumulated day-to-day -day invoices um, without USA. And the actual is the blue one, last year is this one, and you have the budget. So you just, have, you just see that this gap between the actual sales and the needed sales to make money it's just widening and widening and widening. And of course, one of the reasons why this is in the, in the lunchroom is that to induce behavior. We let our employees know that we're actually in, in pretty deep shit. We're not making money. We're not making enough sales. So, so do something. So controlling is, is, is going out and measure performance. And performance can be at a process level and it can be outcomes. And then you follow up on targets. And if the targets are not right, then you take some sort of action. You punish, you reward, you do something. Oh, you don't do reward for, for wrong targets. But you have the same in your uh, education. You get grades, and that's sort of your performance measure. We also have performance measures for how much we publish. But interestingly, performance management is very easy to do. As we have a lot of electronic systems. We have a lot of digital management. Um, Funny enough, it's also creeping into healthcare. And these performance measures, they are extremely good at driving behavior. So here we have a Danish hospital I studied in 2013. At the corporate level, they said, well, we need to be efficient from a societal level. We don't want to create waste. We want to be good citizens. So all slots for the operating theater has to be booked. And it has to be booked Monday morning. So you have an operating theater, meaning there's 10 operating rooms next to each other. Monday morning at seven o'clock, the head physician would book patients for these rooms. So we have 100% booking. Nice. Of course, nice high utilization, good use of resources, but it doesn't really fit re reality. Interestingly, one of the results was that I mean, this is a hospital. There are emergencies. They happen, we can't plan for emergencies. And for this particular specialty, there are about 15% emergencies. And every day it was sort of a surprise. Oh, we have a patient. Oh, it's an emergency. And some patients were already rolled in, prepped for surgery, and they had to be rolled back out. They were planned because we are instituting this 100% planning. So we remove patients for someone who is more urgent. And, and we ask the, the staff, is, it a, is this a big problem? No, never happens, never happens. Of course, with performance management also comes how do we work around performance management system. They didn't cancel patients. They would be punished if they canceled patients, but they could do a patient transfer. A transfer is not noted in any electronic system. A, pa a patient transfer is just noted in the patient's personal file, which is, uh, in 2013, was a simple paper-based file. And it wasn't a problem. So we took out a random week in August, went through all these files. It's not more than what? It was 50, 50 files. More than 80% of these patients were transferred. So this was sort of, oh, this is embarrassing. 80% of patients had been prepped, perhaps had taken time off from work, had been enlisted in a bed ward, had been made ready for surgery, and then suddenly, oh, we have to wait. There's someone who is more important than you. But the essence here is that it's not because the staff is stupid or in any way. They're just, they're just trying to cope with a performance management that is deeply stupid. 
I mean, what we have here is from an engineering sp uh, standpoint, is a, it's a basic queuing system. People end in this queuing system at a random time. And if you go at 100% capacity, the only thing we know for sure is that you're going to get waiting time. So 100% capacity where you have 15% acute patients is simply stupidity. And every engineer has known this since 1800, what, 80, something like that. But for some reason, it hasn't filtered down to politicians yet. So we're still battling performance management systems like this. But the essence of this is that you get what you measure, and the question becomes, do you really want what you get? Here you get dysfunctional performance in a system that should just be smooth running. Best thing could be to have one operating room that didn't do anything but just waiting for acute patients. But that's politically unsound. So here is in uh, talking about this psychosocial work environment and people killing themselves. Here's a story about a bank, a branch office. This is a, the usual Danish small enterprise, 13 full-time employees. The thing we, no we noticed here is that the manager and uh, an assistant, assisting manager, same type. Super technically skilled, very good, good at calculating, not very good at people. Mm, some would say slightly autistic, but uh, that would be putting on the edge. A mixed age group, so basically we have people with children, people with no children. And they organized themselves with individual KPIs, meaning that everyone was measured. So if I made a lot of sales, I get bonus, I get money, nice. We have individual work hours, I can just show up Monday morning, I can also show up in the weekend. These KPIs also mean that every time I complete a sale, I get one point and an extra point. So if I have a, a number of files, I can just show up in the weekend because I talk to the customer in, in the weekdays, I can show up Sunday, Saturday, I might be a little hangover, but it doesn't matter, I can just show up and, and get this done and I get bonus. It works well. There's a lot of focus on sales and output. Thing is that in such a situation where you have a mixed group, you have someone with children, they cannot show up Sunday. You have someone who is partying all week or at least in the weekend, they can show up Sundays. They can get bonus. They can take the Monday off because they're still hungover. I'm putting things, the stressing point of it. But they can stay away on Monday or perhaps Tuesday morning and then customers call in. And suddenly you have eight people working, five on flex time, doing whatever they want. And these eight people have to manage all the regular calls. They cannot process anything. They cannot make their points. They cannot finish their sales. So suddenly you have a, a, a group of people that because of the individual performance managed measures, they divide. They're actually working well together. Now they begin to divide, they go into two groups. The ones that get bonus because they can show up whenever they want and the ones that just have to also almost mop the floors. So when we look at year zero, when they implemented the performance management system, we see that these four measures, understanding, cooperation, engagement and leadership, it's just really, really, really going down. And this is for the, the overall cooperation. And as soon as you hit the point about 3.5, then it's really bad. Then a uh, HR consultant is going to come rolling up in a nice car and say, you have to do something. And they did something. We, all, we were also allowed to measure on a 1 to 100 point scale uh, management, job satisfaction and stress and social support for manager. When you have stress, this is the national average, when you have stress above 5, 35, about 40, then you have what's called somatic stress. You have sleep problems, sleep disorders, you have cramped stomach. You are generally in grave danger of developing uh, <coughs> symptoms and uh, have long-term sickness. So the manager was a senior manager and he was about to retire five years later. So he realized, oh, this cannot be my legacy and something really has to be done. So first thing is that our assistant manager, oh, we're same type, meaning that we have two people that does not communicate well. So he wasn't fired, but we, he was placed in a different branch office where they needed that skill. And then they hired someone who was a real communicator, a real cuddly bear. She could do something with people. She could make people talk and feel well. Then they went on a tea building weekend. And we can, we can have a little bit of fun about that. But the thing is that at this team building weekend, it functioned as a change platform because the employees were asked to make short two minute videos about how they perceived their daily work and how they perceived their manager and assistant manager. 
And this is a way to make managers realize the way they behave. And they will realize, oh, is that me? Do you really see? Am I doing that? That's embarrassing. So it's a way to force people to rethink the way they view themselves. It's a simple trick. It's super powerful. So based on this team building weekend and these realizations, the manager reorganized. Now it's teamwork. Now it's not individual KPIs. If you're working late, then we do it together. We do it Thursday night. We call out. So overtime only when everybody is here. We use games and humor instead of strict KPIs. Instead of having individual bonus, there were balloons. Some of these balloons, there would be a small, not a paycheck, but just a small slip that would give you a lunchbox. Nothing big, but if you made a good sale, you could pop a balloon and then, hey, I got this. It's a small thing. It's not about bonus. It's not about money. It's about this recognition. Well, you did good. Before this system, there was no immediate recognition for what you did. You got your bonus, and that was enough, and you would just have to be satisfied with your bonus. But now instead, you get recognition. You get recognition from the assistant manager, and the old manager also learned that, well, perhaps I should change my behavior. And he did. He wasn't a natural empathist. He wasn't naturally empathetic, but he learned to in, uh, engage and, and, and act. So later, two years later, we measured again. Uh, three out of 13 left the bank. Those three were the ones that <laughs> they made a lot of money on the old individual bonus system. And they didn't really like this. I have to be there at, at regular hours. But suddenly, significant change. Suddenly management, I mean, remember this is a 100 point scale. So when we reach something about 80, we get what's called ceiling effects. It's really, really difficult to get much higher with a slightly diverse group. Job satisfaction. Super rise of job satisfaction. Stress, super change in stress. Suddenly, you're just feeling good at work. Social support for manager. When we ask about management here, we talk about management in general. So, so they ask and, and reply about both people. So it's if, if it's social support, we of course assume that they're referring to the cuddly bear here. But it works. Looking at the comparison between the internal measurements, suddenly, you have understanding, cooperation, engagement, which are some of the highest in the, in the cooperation. This is not a big change. And the point is that they had the same performance with good psychosocial work environment. So by changing performance management, by changing leadership, you have the same overall economic performance, which is quite good, but people have well-being at work. They just change the processes. They change the way they collaborate. And this is a management issue. It's a management issue to spot these things, to organize work so people can work in the systems. We design the systems. We tell who's going to work together and how the process is going to be. So it's our responsibility to look into these things. So if we look at the analysis here, the first line manager, he has good conceptual skills, he has good technical skills, but in, in terms of our understanding in this book, he has limited human, human skills. And the way he handles the organization is less affair in the beginning. He just lets people organize their work. So later, and the first line manager as well is lacking. And the organizational control system, to use the same, individual work, no collaboration. We reward the individual employee. And this promotes this deep sense of injustice. We work a lot with what's called social capital. Social capital is a basic measure of trust, uh, trust and justice and collaboration. And as soon as you, tr you, uh, you touch this justice system, people get annoyed. Justice is basically a balance. It's a balance between me as an individual and the company. And if I feel the balance between me and the company is tipping, I'll do something. I'll react in something that'll tip the balance in the other way. Perhaps I'll be less flexible. Perhaps I'll be more annoyed. Perhaps I'll not do as, as much as I'm supposed to. But this system simply promotes a deep sense of injustice. So the solution in the bank, looking at all these, change in organization, new management, new reward system, that's a planning issue. Collaboration, we break things into three teams instead of individual, we have three teams now. They collaborate, they have fixed work times. In leading, we have a vision of well-being and performance. We motivate with games, we use coordination, we energize individuals, and we control, but we control at a collective level. It's not individual control anymore. It's collective performance. 
And again, if everyone's performing well, everyone gets a bit of a bonus. So it's a real neat system they designed. And it just shows that with a bit of thought, not a big change, a bit of thought that can be used. I'm going to say a few things about competitive advantage. It's basically four things we look at. Again, we like four things. Everything is a two by two matrix uh, <laughs> in social science and, and performance management. So if you want competitive advantage, then this is four things that you can sort of dial on. You can increase uh, quality. And again, it's relative to a competitors. You can increase efficiency, which is basically a cost strategy, whereas quality is a differentiation strategy. You can innovate, which is also a differentiation strategy. We do something different. And we can be responsive to our customers. And here we go back into the business model. What is the value proposition? How is the value proposition to our customers? Have we listened to what they want? And if we have, would they'll be sure to work. Going back to this good old case about Nokia, the ability to outperform with superior uh, <coughs> products because of innovation, responsibility, and efficiency. So why did Nokia fail? We talked about it before, but it's interesting because if we go back 10 years, we look at the iPhone, the Nokia N95, the Samsung Blackjack and Blackberry, they're very similar. Technologically, they're very similar. But we already have the answer that it's, it's the system behind because the talk time, the internet use, actually it doesn't say if they have internet use, but size and, and type, they look the same. They have Wi-Fi, some of them, but it's a change. It's an innovation. It's a completely different type of, of product that, uh, that I've heard, uh, Apple made. They really differentiated themselves in the market at that time. So it's an, an impressive change. But perhaps decision science can give us a peek into what went wrong. Because at this time, Nokia was a super successful organization. Everything worked. They had everything going for them. And suddenly, I mean, really suddenly, within one month, they saw a rapid decline in sales. There was a new play on the market, and sales just, OK, what's going on? So one of the problems here is that they are faced with incomplete information. They have ambiguous in information. We get feedback from the market, and someone is not buying our stuff, and why is it that they're not buying? And how should we interpret that? And they are under super time constraint. They don't know that at this time. I mean, the Nokia managers probably think, ah, it's a fluke, no worries. We'll just leave them, let them burn their money. We're the biggest uh, player, so we'll just hang back and see what happens. Number two, but better, that's a classic strategy as well. But here, time is really critical. So in order to reach a decision, they need to go through these steps, recognize the need for decision. And it seems that at this point, Nokia didn't recognize the need for a decision. When we look back, they thought, well, this is just a fluke. We couldn't really interpret that. And, and they were behind because even though they had realized this, they would have to come up with a new product, with a new platform within six to eight months. Because within these eight months, Apple had most of the market. It was so, so quick. Generate alternatives. I mean, the, the, the thing about generating alternatives is that you have to realize a problem. They didn't realize a problem. So how can you generate good alternatives? And assess the alternative, then you choose among the alternative, and you tr implement the chosen alternative. It's basically that simple, but the, the, the starting point of recognizing the problem, it's easy for us. I mean, we have 10 years hindsight. Oh, they were so stupid. No, they weren't really stupid. They just didn't know what was going on. The logic of the phone market had changed. It changed overnight with something new. And how should they interpret? How should they deal with this? I'm going to switch to talking a bit about the course now because time is running awfully fast. And there's a number of details that's quite interesting. So a bit of practical information. You see, you saw this. The why, the what, the how, this is all about how the Timo course is organized. And we use the business model and we use the organizational things. But the journey is, as Erasmus said, very simple. We have seven weeks here, then you have an individual exam, then we go into part two where you work on the project, then you turn in a group report, and you're evaluated on the group report. 
There's six people in each group. So we try really, really hard to stick to those six people. And we're not supposed to read this. I just want to highlight that this is the structure. Every day, every Wednesday, we have these lectures from 9 to 12. This was a bit special. Usually we divide it into three pieces. One piece where there's a theoretical lecture, then we have a company presentation, and then we have more theoretical lectures. The company presentation, we try to focus on the subject. So we get someone who worked on this, who worked on business model, who worked on organizational issue. And it's really good if you fry them a bit, try to answer, ask questions, because then we get this interesting dialogue. In the afternoon, there'll be a case, and you'll have to work on that case, and that case is reflected in the, in the curriculum. And that's the basic structure of how we do the, the team. So today we're here in Otagon Salem. It's the only time we're here in Otagon Salem. It's because it's the only room where we can fit all 425, I think we are right now. Next week, we're going to be in 1116 Auditorium 81. It's nice if you're here there as many as possible. Of course, we are streaming. It's also available as podcast. We do have the Twitter account so people can ask questions. But frankly, it doesn't work very well. There's a time lag of 15, 20 seconds between here and what you see on your screen at home. Uh, and then getting the, t the Twitter feedback. It means that questions that might be relevant now, in 20 seconds, they're not relevant anymore. So this time lag, it's, we could use something better. And it's embarrassing that at a technical university, we haven't solved this yet. Speaking of a business case. So here at 14th of May, or March, sorry, there will be an individual exam. It's going to be different places because you're going to be spaced a bit. And we have to fill up all the rooms. It's 9.30 to 10.15. Just remember that the meeting time is earlier. You have to be there before. So be there at 9 and everything's going to be good and nice. Of course, then there's Easter holidays. And we have two cases. We have DPA microphones and we have Howdy. These are the cases. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's something Excel that's shifted. Good point. We're not going to divide you and someone's going to have the exam. So I'm going to have a briefing. That's not how it works. <laughs> Could be interesting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just there. So the briefing is the week after. Skipping on, the student that go through this course that we will reward with the best and highest grade will be, uh, will be able to, and I'm just going to skim this through. You're going to be able to identify and summarize key theories, and that's some of it we're going to test in the simple um, uh, scratch-off test. So you have to read the book. You have to learn what's in it. They're easily to read. The concepts are straightforward. You have to, uh, to explain and describe business model organizational design and management activities in a particular case. So here you have the link to the two cases that are going to be the cases you're going to be working on. You have to apply these theories and models. And apply theories means take something from curriculum and use argument to explain to us why it's relevant and how you're going to use it. Analyze this sp specific case from three levels, strategic, tactical, and operational level. So you have to frame it in these three terms. You have to develop and present a coherent argument. It's quite fun we have to write this, but it's not enough to have a bullet point and hand it in. It has to be readable. There is, we know the stuff, but we hand it out to our sensors, and some of these sensors are new, and they have to be able to read it from cover to cover. So it's a basic report, write it so we can read it. And do the mom test in the end, hand it over to your moms and make sure that she doesn't know anything about it. And if she understands it, then it's probably good. I use that a lot. It's, it's working. Um, select organizational interventions and management. So when you do your case analysis, you're going to propose something. You're going to propose some changes and interventions that management should do. And we use the curriculum and the case to sort of motivate this. And there's something about assumptions and preconditions, because this is not 
like two lines under the, the end results. Every time you come up with a, a good explanation, there's always some precondition. There's always some sort of assumption. And instead of leaving that assumption to us, I mean, I could be in an evil mood that morning and say, well, these assumptions, they're not written and they're probably bad, so I'm going to give you a bad grade for this. So write the assumptions, make sure that we know what the assumption is. We assume that the market is going to be, or we assume that management is changing, or we assume that there are a number of things, for instance, resources that are in place. Just make sure make your assumptions explicit. You would do that in a technical assignment as well. So identify and, uh, and analyze the opportunities. You have two concrete real-world business cases, and there will be opportunities. And here, perhaps, you have some opportunity to use your engineering skills. You see something about software, you see some technical issues, use that. We, we really like when you have these uh, engineering skills and you've, you, tr you get that into your, into your reports. It just makes it much more interesting and much more relevant. The multiple choice test is going to be is going to count as 30 percent, and the group report is going to count as 50 percent. Oh, sorry, 70 percent. Thank you. First, the simple things you'll be measured on. That's the the multiple choice exam, and if you read the books and you know the concepts, then it's fairly straightforward. So here you, you, we test the basic learning, identify and summarize key theories, and explain uh, and describe business models. And it's super simple to use a scratch-off test. Basically, you just bring a coin, you scratch off. It's like a lottery ticket, but only bring coin, pen, and nothing else. So the next thing is a report. Then you go through all the other things. Apply theories, analyze the specific case, develop and present your coherent argument. And coherent also means that as a group, it's really nice if you read each other's stuff and said, well, perhaps there's something that should go in between. Sometimes we re read reports and there are th six distinct chapters. They don't go together in any way and they're written in almost different languages and it just doesn't make for a good report. Um, speaking from bad experience. So select the organization, outline the intervention, identify opportunities. That's what you're going to do in the report. These are the, the six points that have to be part of the report. Low practicalities. The multiple choice exam, 14th of May. Remember that. At campus, registration is automatic, so you'll all, the way, all, all of you will be enlisted. No aids allowed. Don't bring books, don't bring anything. Some clever uh, students sometimes bring business uh, translational books, a Danish to English business book, um, dictionaries. Don't do that. It's not allowed. It doesn't make sense. It's like cheating. And we will simply remove the books or, you, uh, or your aids. <laughs> it's a scratch off. So again, the little thing, bring a pen, ID, something to scratch off with, nothing else. There'll be a briefing on the exam the 7th in uh, 1116-81. And the group report deadline, 2nd of May. Submission, you have to hand in two copies, one for us, one for sensor, one for the registry, and a PDF on DTU inside. And that will be checked for the usual, have anyone written this before and done anything? There'll be a briefing, 21st of March. And that be uh, uh, in, in two different rooms because of the two different challenges. Anything, question, something? Yeah. I'm just going to give you this because no one can hear anything. Heads up or down. Oh, that hurt. I was more wondering about um, this afternoon at like 1 to 5, mm -hmm. the exact, the, how is it exactly with going to which class and which I'm building? We'll go through this in five mm -hmm. minutes and it's going to be, a, it's probably going to be chaos. <laughs> we expect uh, <laughs> slight levels, so slight to high levels of frustration. Me too. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Good. So now we've done the introduction, why practical information, and now group forming, afternoon session. And this is where the chaos begin. You have to form groups. The goal is that all groups have six members. 
six members, not five, not four, but six members. So when you meet your TA in form, your TA is about your group name. We have all sorts of awkward names and <laughs> some are more appropriate than others. We don't censor, but just have a group name. Work with the group. There will be a contract on did you inside. A contract is to say, we're going to work on this. And it's a way for you to specify how we're going to work together. It's simply a tool for you to become a better group. A group goes through a number of phases. And in the beginning, it's really nice if you don't know each other to start getting a common idea of what you want. What are the grade levels? What are the theoretical interests? Are we, can we work together? Sign it. It's a good idea. So here for the, the, the annoying part. Students who already have groups of six, you will show up in building 450, room 06AB, and there you will register with the TAs. So if you're already a group that works well together, show up in B, uh, building one, uh, 415, room 06A and B. If you have a group of five, you will go to building 450, room 106, a and B, you will register with the TAs, and you will anticipate to have an additional group member. You must anticipate there will be an extra group member. If you are less than five, that means four and less, go to 1116, rooms 17, 19, 44, and 49. There you will register and anticipate extra group members. So it's going to be nicely and chaotic in the afternoon. And IAM students go to building 116, uh, room 42, and form groups of six and register with the TA. So it's going to be messy. And, and here we see the difference between the DTU strategy and the practicalities. We want, in some cases, large classes. We simply don't have the facilities to manage large classes. Yep. <laughs> The idea with the IEM students going to another It's room? basically because it's our own master and uh, we want them to be able to work together and, and form a network because they're going to be working with the same kind of, of cur curriculum in the masters. So this is an opportunity for them to get to know each other. That's the only idea. Okay, so we could uh, go to another room. If or you find that your IEM mates are not that interesting, you can do whatever. Okay. We, uh, it's, a, it's a suggestion. All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, heads up. <laughs> we are industrial engineers, but mm -hmm. also exchange students for one semester. Should mm -hmm. we go in the IAM section or does it You have matter? a choice. If you want to learn your fellow IAM students, then I suggest you go to the IAM group. But, uh, <laughs> but we are not master students. Um, still same course. Okay. But. Other questions, comments? No, 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 no. And we have a lot of TAs, and they're going to be there for you in the afternoon. Could you stand up so we can see all of you? You don't have to say a lot. Just these are our TAs, and they will help you and guide you. And they all had exceptional performance in previous Timo courses. So they'll be yours, not yours, but they'll help you the best they can and work with you in the afternoon. Thanks a lot. So next time, business model and uh, case analysis and read chapters one, two, and three in business model generation. That's the, uh, the colorful book and text on analysis. And basically, that's it. Thank you so much for commenting and questioning. Super motivating. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.